Hello, and welcome to Reading Greek Tragedy Online. I'm Joel Christensen from Brandeis University, and I'm here with the Center for Hellenic Studies, the Cosmos Society, Out of Chaos Theater, and a great cast and special guest today. We have Aldo Bringas, Evelyn Miller, Maria Goikulea, Paolo Ma Omani, Bryce Ruspach, and Tim DeLapp, and our special guest today is Helena Foley. Today we bring you Euripides' Heraclidae, or the Children of Heracles, and was performed sometime around 430 BCE, just as the Athenians were beginning their three-decade war against the Spartans. It may not be Euripides' most famous play, but it has just about everything you would ask for in a tragedy. Themes of xenia, suppliancy, noble bloodlines, battle, human sacrifice, gender, a war scene described in a messenger's speech, and revenge. And like any good tragedy, it focuses on the choices human beings make outside of their fate in divine meddling. But its end is troubling, perhaps reflecting the world outside of the play where violence is far from distant and death is for many certain. For while this is the year that Athens repels the Spartan invasion and attacks the Peloponnese, it's also the first year of the famous play, plague. So this play so focused on the descendants of Heracles and the end of feuds seems so precariously set at the beginning of things. Um, and it's one of these plays that's just not performed as well. Um, it's not as uh, read as much as other plays. So that's why I'm really happy today to have Elena Foley here with me who's done work on tragedy um, of all types um, to help us understand what's going on in this play. Elena, if you have to tell someone what's there to look at in this play, and what, the, what the, this play is sort of about at the beginning, what would you say? How do you introduce it? Um, I would say that it really is dealing with a lot of very important co contemporary issues, but they're issues that they've had on their minds for a long period of time. I mean, I think it's important that the play is set in Athens, mm -hmm. which means you can't do the, quite the same thing with a tragedy that you can do with plays that happen in other settings. It has to turn out okay for the Athenians at the end. And it's dealing with issues that could be very controversial with the audience. And so there has to be more care because it could be viewed as more personal. So for example, we have a king in this play um, who is the son of Theseus, uh, a Demophon, who is a monarch, but he behaves in very democratic ways in comparison to many other kings. Um, and so he's clearly re representing these people more directly in, in large parts of the play and, and needs to consult them. Um, and the issues that are being dealt with in the play, as you were already beginning to say, are very contemporary. I mean, Athens is at you know, the beginning stages of the Peloponnesian War. They're really worried about what's going to happen to them and um, the integrity of their land. And at the end of the play, when the um, Mycenaean or Argive uh, king, Eurystheus promises that his dead body will be protective for the Athenians in the future. Um, this is obviously uh, very relevant because the Athenians were worried that the Spartans were actually gonna attack them on land, which indeed they did very shortly after this play. So at this point, Eurystheus' body could actually be heroic protection for Athens and soon it wasn't going to be. And the whole story of the children of Heracles is also a complicated one. Um, it was part of the, the famous Athenian funeral orations for the war dead in Athens. People always referred back to the fact that, they, that Athens was a place that um, took in the weak and protected um, refugees and suppliants who were being mistreated elsewhere when nobody else would do that. Um, <clears throat> and yet at the same time, the people that they're saving here are the Heraclidae who in the end turn out to be the ancestors of the Spartans with whom the Athenians are just starting very seriously to be at war. So they should be very grateful to what's happening to them here, but we know that sort of many generations later, they will actually turn out to be the enemies. And ironically, Eurystheus, who starts out to be the enemy, ends up to be a friend of Athens in his hero cult. So all of these issues, um, and then I think also it's very clear that after the Persian Wars, 
there were an enormous number of people emigrating into Athens and some of them were refugees. And the real issue of what Athens, what kind of status people in Athens were, were going to have and what kind of attitude there should be for them was a sort of ongoing, really important issue. This isn't the only suppliant play of Euripides. Um, and it goes back really to Aeschylus's uh, suppliant women, which also deals with the whole question of what are what is Athens going to do with the refugees and what kind of status are they going to have? Um, and maybe Athenian citizenship laws had something to do also in 450 with these issues. So there's a lot of contemporary issues in this play. So you've just given me even more things to complicate the play for me. Uh, so so let, let's, there are a few things I think we can talk about before we start the performance. Um, one is some sort of the, let's say the mythical material and the names that might confuse people. But let's start with the, the strange motif, right? We're at the beginning of the, of the Peloponnesian War and we decide to put on a play where we front the fact that um, we gave suppliancy to the ancestors of the kings who are fighting us. Um, <laughs> Is this some sort of like one upsmanship? Is an exploration of complicated relationships? How do you think this sort of, this theme would have struck Athenian audiences at the time? I know that's a hard thing to answer, um, but what kind of play is going on here? Well, I think I think that's a really good question, and I think it would really depend on the audience um, because I think there would be very different views in mm -hmm. the audience about this issue and refugees, maybe especially at this particular moment when they were starting to be at war and they were really feeling very threatened in relation to the Athens survival. And yet the war hadn't gone on long enough that you know we were gonna anticipate from the beginning that it was gonna go on for more than 30 years. Right, and that's, yeah. that's one of our problems uh, living now, right? As we look back in the Peloponnesian War and we say, oh, 430, it's the beginning of it all. But in 430, it was just another conflict with Sparta. Yes. Right. Yeah. And, and so this may be a text, right? This move may be one, you know, and this is simplifying, maybe looking at sort of our shared Greekness in and against the conflict, right? It, even as it might be sort of, again, so uh, taunting the Spartans in a way. Or maybe they, you know, the Spartans should really remember going back to this Heraclitus story that they really had something, you know, in common and that they really shared Heracles as a hero and that they were, um, you know, the father of all the Heraclitus. And, and, um, and that, and, you know, they shared that in the Persian Wars and that they fought together. And so, you know, to emphasize the ancestry that they shared at this point is maybe helpful, but, and, and, you know, one of the things I'm forgetting the name of the of the family, but one of the things we forget again is how often Greek politicians would use mythical history um, as part of their rhetoric. Right. So with Megara, the Athenians were always insisting way around. But there's it's constant playing with the past. So one of the things about this play, though, that I think for modern audiences can be a little daunting are the characters. Um, because we're not really in sort of the A class of mythical characters for the average person. We're down in sort of like B and C, right? Um, so maybe I think it might be useful if we go through the roster of characters for the audience. So um, we have Eurystheus, Eolaus, and Alcmena really to start out the beginning, right? So who's Eurystheus, Eolaus, and Alcmena? Okay, well, Eurystheus, it, probably people do know that Heracles spent most of his life performing labors. And he had to perform those labors, her first cousin, whom mm -hmm. Hera managed to trick into being born before Heracles and therefore he became king instead of Heracles and Heracles had to spend his whole life doing labors for him. And he was obviously very mean to Heracles <laughs> and kept him at a distance. So, and now that Heracles himself is dead, he is afraid that all of the children of Heracles will eventually take some kind of revenge on him for this horrible lifetime that he's given to their father. And Iolaus is his first, is Heracles' first cousin who shared many of his labors. And now he's an old man trying to take care of these um, vulnerable children who are being attacked by Eurystheus and his army because waiting on the border to grab them. And Alcmena is the mother of Heracles who um, produced Heracles with the god Zeus. 
Yeah. And she's also very old at this point. And she's <laughs> taking care of the girl children and he's taking care of the boy children. Right. And so where we find ourselves at the beginning of the play then is that Elaus is out here giving a, uh, you know, an introduction to the action and they have been harried um, throughout Greece trying to find a place to settle and they're in Athens. And it's not the Athens you may know from other plays because it's not Theseus, but his son Demophone, Demophone who's there. Um, and the action is starting as Eurystheus and his armies are about to arrive. So Helena, you say you've only seen, you know, you haven't seen this much performed. What, what are you looking for in this performance? What will you be watching? Um, well, this is a little complicated to talk about now, but I think the complications will begin to emerge in the scenes. But in the first scene, we really see, um, you know, a bad Mycenaean herald come in and try to drag the children back to Aristius. And then we have Iolaus response to that and Demophon giving a very positive um, response. And then the play becomes very complicated after that. Yeah. And I think maybe we should keep more people in suspense we will. because wrinkles occur, which complicate this lovely beginning where it seems like Athenians are just being the perfect funeral oration pathos for everybody. And in, in typical Euripidean fashion, the play goes off the rails and then off the rails again, and then ends some, somewhere completely different. Yeah. So we'll start with your Laos uh, and uh, that Mycenaean herald, um, mm -hmm. and we'll see just what happens. Men, citizens of ancient Athens protect us. We are here, citizens sitting by the altar of Zeus, protector of the marketplace as suppliants to him, yet we are being treated most violently. Help us, men of Athens. Our garlands of supplication have been defiled, citizens. This is a disgrace to the city, an insult to the gods. Gah! Hey, hey. What's going on? What screams are these coming so close from the altar? Some horror is about to happen. Oh, look there. That poor, frail old man has fallen on the ground. Who did this to you, you poor old creature? That man there, friends. He has dishonored your gods. He wants to drag me away from the steps of Zeus's altar by force. But you, old man, from which land have you come to this country of four cities? Did you come by ship from the island of Euboa? No, I'm not an islander. I have come here from Mycenae. By what name do the people of Mycenae address you? I'm Eolaus. You must have heard of the man who stood by Heracles' side. I'm not bereft of fame. Yes, I have heard of you. But tell me, whose children are these in your arms? Oh, these are the sons of Heracles' friends. They have come to you and to your city as suppliants. Tell me then, old man, why are you here? Do they want to speak to the people of this city? What they want is not to be dragged away from the altars of the gods and by force taken back to Argos. Not good enough. The men who rule you and found you here will not be satisfied by this. Stranger, we must respect those who seek refuge in the gods. These people should not be forced to leave their sanctuary. We will not allow you to treat the goddess justice with such disrespect. They belong to Eurystheus. Send them off from this land now, and I will not lay a hand on them. It is a godless act to banish strangers who have come here as suppliants. But it is far better thing for someone to keep his foot outside of a place of trouble. Much better to use wisdom. What about you? Shouldn't you have talked with the ruler of this land before you started dragging these poor people away from the sanctuary of the gods? You should show more respect towards a free land. So who then is the ruler of this land here? Demophon, the son of noble Theseus. 
So I must take this war of words with him then. Everything else I've said with you has been a wasted effort. Ah, well, here is the man himself with his brother Akamas hurrying here to hear what you have to say. Ah, an old man. And you've managed to outpace the young in getting here to the altar of Zeus. So tell us then, what's brought these people here? These are the sons of Heracles, my lord, suppliants. Their wreaths of supplication, as you can see, my lord, are placed on the altar of the god. This man is their father, Eolaus. So, why did this event call for cries of help? This man here, my lord, tried to drag them away from the altar by force. That's why they cried out for help. He knocked this poor man down to the ground. I was moved to tears with pity for the old man, my lord. The way he's dressed tells me he's a Greek, but his manner tells me he's a barbarian. Explain yourself then. And do it without wasting my time. What land are you from? Argos. I am an Argive, if that's what you want to know. But let me tell you why I have come here and under whose orders. I have sent here by my king Eurystheus, the king of Mycenae, and under, under orders to take these children back to him. My mission is just, my friend. The deeds I must do and the things I must say are all just. I am an Argive, sir, and I am taking back Argives who have run away, trying to escape the punishment of death and sentence by the laws of my country, Argos. All Argives have the right to fix and manage the laws of their own city and apply them upon each other. We have approached the homes of many other citizens and declared our stand to these principles to them. No one has dared to bring trouble upon his himself. Still, these people have obviously come to your land, either because they thought that you are a fool or in utter desperation, they took their chances with you. Because surely they did not expect that if you had your wits about you, if you were not a fool, you of all the rulers of all the many countries they passed through, you would sympathize with their foolish misfortunes. Choose then from these two options. Either you accept these people into your land, or you let us take them away. The benefits of the second options are this. Your city will become the ally of powerful Argos and that of mighty Eurystheus. If you choose the first option, however, and you let your spirits soften by the pitiful tears and begging, then the matter will need to be resolved with spares because you don't even think that we will let it rest without contesting it with steel. And what reason will you give for engaging in war with us then? What land or what price will you claim with you were robbed off that has caused you to go war against Argos? Or when you're burying your falling soldiers, which allies will you say they were defending? The condemnations for, from your citizens will deserve indeed if you were to let your foot step into such a quagmire for the sake of a group of children and an old man, a totally insignificant man, a man with one foot in the grave, as they say. What will you say then? The best you could say to plead your cause for war would be that you can rest your hopes upon these boys. But look at them. That hope is far too short from being realistic. Even when they are fully grown up and fully armed, they would be no match for the Argives. If that is where you rest your hope, then forget it because there's also the matter of time. The time between now and when these boys will become men is long. Long enough for you to be totally destroyed. No, sir. You need to give me nothing but what is my own and you will gain mighty Mycenae as your ally. And don't fall for your, your unusual mistake, that of choosing the weak over the powerful. Who can judge 
or choose the merits of a case before one hears clearly both sides of it. My Lord Demophon, what exists here in your land, but not in any other land, is the fact that just as I have listened, I am also in turn able to speak without being sent away before I have finished saying what I have to say. This man, my Lord, he and us, we have nothing in common. The laws of his city have banished us. We are exiled from Mycenae, from our native land, banished from it. So how can we just, how can he justly call us Mycenaeans and then take us away back to that land? So far as they're concerned, we are now foreigners. Or do you think that banishing someone from Mycenae means that they are also banished from the rest of Greece? At least, not so from Athens. And the Athenians will not send the children of Heracles away from the land because they are afraid of the Argives. No, this is not Trachis, nor some town in Achaea from which you dragged away these children, even though they were suppliants seeking refuge at the altar of gods. And you didn't achieve that by pleading a just cause, but by bragging about Argos, just like you're doing now. If this happens here, too, and they fall for your words, then I will not be able to think of Athens as a free country anymore. No, they won't because I know the mind and nature of these people very well. They would rather die because men of virtue would much rather die than feel shame. But enough praise about the city. Too much praise can bore people. I know because I personally have felt bored when people have praised me too much. But to you, as the ruler of this land, it is your duty to save these children. You see, your father is Theseus, who was the son of Aethra, who was the daughter of Pythaeus, who in turn was the son of Pelops. As for these children, let me tell you of their lineage. Heracles was the son of the god Zeus and Alcmene, who was Pelops's daughter. And so you see, your father and their father are the sons of first cousins. Therefore, Demophon, you are related to these children. But beyond this tie of blood, let me tell you what your obligations are towards them. Let me tell you, Demophon, that as your father's shield bearer, I once crossed the oceans with Theseus to go and fetch that most murderous girdle that belonged to the queen of the Amazons, Hippolyta. After that, Heracles went on to rescue your father from the dark dungeons of Hades. The whole of Greece can attest to that event. And it is by way of recompense for that event that these children now ask from you this one single thing, which is that you don't hand them over to their enemy. Don't let their enemy use force against them and drag them away from the altars of your gods and away from your land. I beg you, Demophon. I wrap my hands around your knees and touch your beard in supplication. These children of Heracles have fallen into your care. Do not betray that care and be their true relative. Be their friend, their father, their brother, their master. All things are preferable to be handed over to the Argives. My Lord, I have heard their plight and I feel deep pity for them. This is a true example of how nobility can be toppled by fate. These children, my lord, though they have been born into a noble home, they are now suffering an undeserved misfortune. Elas, there are <clears throat> three thoughts that force me not to reject your words. The first and most important Thought is Zeus, at whose altar you and this group of children stand as suppliants. The second is the fact that I'm related to them and I'm so obliged by the fact to make sure that for their father's sake, they should treat, be treated well by us. Finally, it is the fear of shame, a fear that concerns me more than anything else. Because if I were to allow the violent pollution of this altar by a foreigner, people will think that I no longer rule a land that is free and that I betrayed its suppliants because I was afraid of the Argives. That would be a crime almost as serious enough for me to hang myself. Of course, I would have much preferred it if a much happier circumstance had brought you here, but nevertheless, I have no fear that you and these children will be forcefully removed by anyone from this altar. No. You go to Argos and you tell your king, Eurystheus, what's happened here. Tell him also that if he has a lawful charge against these people, that he'll be treated lawfully, but you won't be dragging these children away from here. 
And what if my cause were just and my words victorious? What justice is there in abducting suppliants? This is easy for you to say. No harm will come to you, but I will be disgraced. I will be a disgrace were I to let you drag these children away. Oh, well then, just take them outside the borders of your city and we'll take them away from there. Only fools think they can outwit the gods. It seems to me that this is a place where criminals can find refuge. The precincts of the gods are common refuge for everyone. This might not be the view of my Mycenians. The Mycenians are not in charge here. I am. Huh. Only if you behave wisely and not offended them. Be offended all you want. I shall not sin against the gods. No, I'd rather you don't go to war against Argos. Nor would I. But I am not going to let these children be taken away. Just the same, since they are mine, I will take them. In that case, you shall find your path back to Argos to be very difficult. Well, we'll see soon about that. The moment you touch these children will be the moment you groan with pain. No, my lord, in heaven's name, don't strike a messenger. I shall certainly strike this messenger if he doesn't learn some sense. You, go away. And you... My lord, come, don't touch him. All right, I will leave. A single man is weak in a fight, but I shall return with a big, fully armed force of Argive soldiers. These are thousands. There are thousands of fully armed men with Iris Theos as their general waiting for my report about this. They're just outside the southern borders of our city at Megara. The moment Eurystheus hears of your insolence, he will pounce with rage upon you and upon your city, your people and your crops. This is precisely why we have such a large army of young men, to punish people like you. Go hang yourself, you vulgar creature. I'm not afraid of you or your Argos. I'm not gonna let you abduct this city's suppliants and in the process put me to shame. This is Athens. A city that is free, a city that is ruled by me, not by your Argos. So, Helena, what we're treated to in that first scene, it was a, a, a dizzying array of genealogical details, but a, a basic motif of Euripidean tragedy, right? We have an ego. Right, we have two sort of plaintiffs, and we have um, Demo Demophon at the center as sort of a judge. Right, mm -hmm. so it's a bit of a play on one, um, but uh, there's a real <laughs> effort made to explain why um, saving the children is the right idea. Right, and there are multiple points that are emphasized. Right, one there's the sort of Xenia relationship that has to be honored, the right, the divine right of suppliancy, the kinship. Um, and then general um, issue of justice. Why do we have to try so hard to make this argument? Right? It seems like a really strongly made argument with several different principles um, and any one of them would suffice. Uh, well, I think it has to do with the contemporary situation because all of these principles that we're talking about are um, becoming very controversial. Is there such a thing as a series of norms or international law that people can agree to from one city to the next? Or is that really under the situation of the Peloponnesian War when Greeks are fighting each other, are those things going to start to be sacrificed? Normally speaking, if somebody is a suppliant to a god at an altar, as in this case, in principle, you should respect that suppliancy because they're um, have appealed to a god, and you should not drag them away from the altar as Capius wants to do. That's violating, which Demohan keeps emphasizing, a really important principle. On the other hand, we know that many other people, especially during the Peloponnesian War, did not, in re historical reality, respect suppliancy. <laughs> they did drag people away from altars, and there was a sense that every one of these principles here become at stake? Do you stick to your democratic principles and suppliancy and 
the treating the weak, or do you really decide as as Kropius keeps saying, think about your advantage, what kind of allies are you gonna have? Are we gonna make you know real politics take precedence over well, important principles? So immediately after I asked you that question, I deflated because <laughs> all I could think of is all the arguments marshaled against our actions at the, our southern border over the past few years, right? We mentioned, you know, this is against our constitution. This is against international human rights laws. This is against basic human de decency. This is against our religious uh, background, yet we still do it, right? Um, and so what I find <laughs> seductive about this is how certain Demophone is from the beginning that they're right. Right. He doesn't flinch. He accepts it and he, he accepts it bravely. Um, what do you what kind of resonance do you find in this action? Um, well, I think I think it's you know, it sounds very great because this very large army is sitting there at the border ready to actually attack them over this issue. And there are complicated issues in, in uh, the questions that were raised. For example, I lost as well. You know, my CD doesn't have any um, jurisdiction over us anymore because they condemned us to death and, you know, banished us. And he says, yes, they do. They were condemned to death. And uh, we should we should allow these people to be um, brought back to Argos as the way we constantly argue of should should somebody who is has come to another country and claimed some kind of asylum, can they be taken back for criminals and criminal acts in the place that they came from or not yeah. um you know it's not it's not so it sounds very virtuous and it's true that in tragedy nobody ever violates the suppliancy physically but on the other hand every one of these issues are inner complicated international issues that were being argued over Right. And, and, you know, when, when um, Kaprios makes that comment that, you know, the initial mis mistake is to favor the weak over the powerful, um, this sounds so much like something from later on in the Peloponnesian War, right? When we think about um, the Mytilenean debate and the Melian dialogue um, from Thucydides. Um, so, you know, a couple of things in the background that, that, I, that occurred to me that I hadn't really thought deeply about before. So uh, the Argives in the historical period, aren't buddy-buddy with Sparta. No. <laughs> right? Um, so, I mean, is this something we have to read in here? So we can't, it's not just about Athens and Sparta, right? I mean, there's a whole other world of Greek cities beyond those two. Um, is, is there some sort of other alliances being appealed to or am I making it more complicated than it needs to be? I think you're making it complicated because, <laughs> because the Heraclidae are the ones that are trying to be rescued, the future Spartans. Yeah. And yes, at this point, Ar Argos was a democracy and definitely, you know, uh, sympathetic to Athens at this point. So when you're emphasizing, um, if you're turning the Argives into the bad guys, um, this is something that isn't fitting historical reality at the moment. And so I think it raises a really interesting question that I, I don't think I can resolve, but I think it's a great thing to discuss. Well, yeah, it, it, and you know, I, I've read this play a few times and this time I thought, oh, wait, something interesting going on here and usually where I go with these things is why I don't know where to go. Um, so you in this viewing in this debate what are a few things that caught your eye and what what so I already brought up my questions you saw where I was going but what did you hear in the play that maybe you hadn't seen before? Hmm interesting question. Um, I'm sorry to prep you for that. Well I, I as, as a Euripidean scholar I always have a tendency to think that the person who goes second in debate um, generally tends to have a slightly more successful and appealing argument, at least initially. Yeah. But this time, the more I thought about some of the things that I was saying, I was asking myself more questions. Okay. Because partly because, um, and this is to anticipate later on in the play, they're asking for a lot from Athens and they're not promising to give anything back except not to set, attack them in the, in the future. Yeah. And what Ilos is relying on is this relationship between elites, between Theseus and Heracles. And yet we're in Athens, which is a city, which is a democracy in which the interest of the whole city is really, I think in the end, the important issue. 
so and, and, I was hearing more complexity in the debate. Right, and, and we are, and we know, you know, from history that these sort of uh, trans-state aristocratic, aristocratic relationships complicate the issues, right? Um, where families aren't necessarily loyal to their countries, right? but instead they're loyal to, well, themselves and their, and their own relatives. Um, so could you, before we move on, could you piece together for us this relationship between the family of Theseus and Heracles um, and, and how it's centered in the play? Well, it is pretty important because basically Theseus was in deep trouble. He was, you know, the primal Athenian hero who many of whose labors totally imitated Heracles. Um, so they weren't actually really some of the time in quite the same generation, although clearly they were in this play. And Theseus was stuck down in the underworld because he and his buddy went down there to abduct Persephone and got stuck down there because they were doing inappropriate things. And Heracles rescued him when he came down to perform his last labor to take the dog of Her uh, Hades Cerberus back up and, and save Theseus. Mm. So it's true that Theseus really owes something very important to Heracles because he really was saved <laughs> completely <laughs> by him <laughs> for bad behavior. But otherwise, I mean, you know, Heracles has such an important footprint in Greek myth, um, but its connection to Athens otherwise is rather tenuous. Yes, but the Athenians always want to have a relationship with Heracles. <laughs> They're always trying to appropriate him, as, as is every other Greek city, in one way or another, to create a mythological connection. And they liked to, they, they were hoping that Heracles you know, would continue to be a hero who was on their side and help them in the war. So some of the biggest twists and turns in this play are about to happen, and we'll get to speak, uh, we'll get to talk at length about them near the end. Um, so we don't want to give them away, right? Um, but if there are a couple themes that you think are activated in the last two thirds of the play for people to look for, what would they be? Well, I think, I think some of the surprises are that when you make one of these kind of very humanitarian gestures, things can turn out to be more complicated than you think they're going to be. Mm -hmm. um, when you make the decision, <laughs> Things can become very difficult, then new issues can come up, which compromise what you think is a wonderful principle to stand up for. So I think that's really important. And I think that there, we, we haven't heard from the people who are really about to be sacrificed in this situation, right. the children um, and, and also Alcmina, the mother of Heracles. We know they're there what they are characters in the situation and what 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 is their reaction going to be and what are they going to be like as opposed to what we've seen so far, which is one old man talking to a herald. But this, so, one of the powerful things about this play and what was mentioned in, uh, when we discussed the suppliants um, is that oftentimes when we're talking about refugees, um, we don't actually treat them as individual human beings with agency. Right, um, they're objects. They're part of sort of international play, um, but they're also human beings. Um, so in this play, we're about to hear from them, um, and they're going to take some. You know, it's going to take some interesting plot turns. And we see them there on the stage, the whole bunch of children, and you know, they've been silent so far. But so um, it, we're going to skip a few scenes right now, or skip a scene. And what happens in the scene that we miss is there's a chorus that sort of reflects on the right and wrong of what's happened. And then De Demophon returns with bad news from the oracles. Uh, oracles rarely, of course, give good news. Um, the Athenians can be victorious, but only if they sacrifice a maiden of noble birth, which is a story you've probably heard elsewhere. Um, the herald reiterates, or Dem Demophon reiterates his desire to help the children of Heracles, but he's not prepared to lose his own children or any children of the Athenians. Once again, all seems lost for your Laos and the children of Heracles um, until something else happens. And that's where we'll start the next scene. Dear strangers, please do not consider my coming out here as an act of impudence. Let that be my first request. 
I am well aware that for a woman, it is best that she is silent, modest, and remains quietly inside her house. But then, Aeolus, I have heard your anxious words, and though I was not given the charge by my family to do so, I nevertheless feel that I am fit to do this. And since I am very concerned about my brothers and about my own self, I have come out here to ask you, Aeolus, if there is some new misfortune on top of all the others that has come to trouble your mind. Dear girl, I've always thought of you as one of the best children that Heracles ever had, and justly so, it seems. Well, child, we thought that we were on the right track up until now, but here we are. We find that once more, we are heading in the wrong direction with no prospects of escape, because the chanters tell us that according to the oracles, if we in the city are to survive this, then it's not a bull or a calf that we must sacrifice to Demeter's daughter, but the daughter of a noble. And that's where we're stuck now. The king here says that he will neither sacrifice his own daughter nor force any of his citizens to do so. As well, he has also told me in subtle but clear words that since he wants to save Athens, we must find some other way out of this difficulty or else leave here and find some other land to go to. So is it this prophecy that stops us being saved? Yes, my child, just this prophecy. In all other matters, we are fortunate. Then Aeolus, fear the enemy spear of the Argives no longer. I am ready, old sir, ready and willing to volunteer to be sacrificed, to die for this cause. What reason could we possibly give for trying to save our lives instead of saving a city that has accepted our call for help and has suffered such pain and danger on our behalf? No, we can't do that. We would be ridiculed by people if we sit by the altars of gods as suppliants and wail like cowards when we are, in fact, the children of such a great man. What honourable men would see this as proper? No, rather the city fell, though may the gods forbid it, and I fell to the enemy with it, than I, the daughter of a splendid man, have to suffer dishonour and then die just the same. But then, how could I cope with the fate of a wandering exile? Would I not feel shame when people ask me, do you love your life so much that you have come here to our land bearing the boughs of a suppliant? Leave this land. We give no aid to cowards. As well, I know. Many have betrayed their loved ones before me, but not even if my brothers here had died and I survived, not even then could I ever hope to live a happy life. Because who would want to marry a single woman like me? one who has no family, and to have children with me. Well then, is it not better for me to die than to endure the terrors of a fate I do not deserve? No, that fate is more appropriate for someone who is not born from a family as noble as mine. Come now. Take me to where this body must be slain. Place the garlands on me, and if this is your wish, begin the rites of sacrifice. Defeat the enemy. I give my life of my own accord and under no one's compulsion, and I am willing to die, not only for the sake of my brothers, but also for my own sake because I have discovered this splendid thing, that by not loving my life so much, I can die a most glorious death. How can one respond to this girl's lofty speech? She's willing to give her life to save that of her brothers. What mortal could utter words loftier than those? Oh, my child, you are truly of the seed of divine Heracles. 
You are truly no one else's daughter but that of that brave hero. And your words, dear girl, make me feel proud, but I also feel sad for your fate. But let us do this more justly, Makaria. Let us bring out here all of your sisters and let us decide this by lot. Let her who draws the lot die for the family. It is not right that you die without having drawn lots. No, old man, do not even consider such a thing. I will not die by drawing lots. What value does such a death have? I will not die by compulsion, but if you approve of me, and if you wish to make use of my willingness to die for my brothers, then I will do so. Oh, my child, a speech even more noble than the last, a noble speech itself. Your new deeds and words become more noble than your last. I won't force you nor forbid you to die, Makaria. But by dying, you do your brothers good. Wide, wise words, old man. Come with me, old man, because I want to die by your own hands. Though you must not fear that my blood will cause you religious pollution, I am dying of my own free will. And when I am dead, cover my dead body with my garments. If I'm truly the daughter of the man I'm boasting to be, then I fear not the terror of this sacrifice. No, my child, I can't. I do not have the strength to stand there and watch you die. Well then, ask this man if I may be allowed to breathe my last in the hands of women instead of men. Wishes, poor girl, will be granted. It would indeed be shameful of me not to grant you your rightful funeral wishes and that for many reasons. You are a brave young woman and it is also just and proper that I grant it. You are indeed the bravest woman I've ever seen, bravest of them all. Well then, if you wish, say your words of farewell to your brothers here and uh, to this old man before you go. Farewell, old friend. Farewell, and teach these boys how to be just like you. Wise in all things, just like you, that you would make them adequately wise. Try your best to save them from death. We are all your own children, raised by your own hands, and you can see that I, myself, am sacrificing my own wedding day for them. And you, my brothers, who are gathered here all around me, I hope you will find happiness in life and gain all the things that my heart will not. Respect and honour this old friend and the old woman inside the temple, Akhmeni, my grandmother as well as all these people here who are your hosts. And if you are ever free from all of your troubles and the gods let you return home, think of the woman who saved your lives and consider what burial rites you owe her. Surely they should be the best possible because I did not neglect my family in its hour of need, but gave my life for it. And if there is anything beneath the earth, then I go there with these thoughts as my dowry and not as a mother or as a woman who gave her virginity. But I hope there's nothing there. Because if we mortals must deal with cares even after we die, then where can we go to be free of them? Do not people consider death to be the cure of all care. So with that troubling statement, um, Macaria exits the stage in life um, and news arrives that Hylas has brought reinforcements to fight against the Argive army, um, which is commanded by Eurystheus. Uh, Yolaus is determined to join the fight despite the advice from the chorus and Heracles' own mother, Alcmina. And that's where we'll continue with the next scene right now. Elaus, you'll never be young again. Are you out of your mind, Elaus? Do you want to leave me alone with the children? 
Yes, Alkmeni. Men must fight. Women must look after children. But who will save me if you die? Those of your son's sons who will survive will take care of you. But what if something happens to them? Heaven forbid. Don't be afraid, woman. Our friends here will not give up. Give up to the enemy. And they are my only hope. Zeus too, Alcmene. He cares for you in your many pains, I know that. Oh, well, yeah, Zeus. He won't hear me speak ill of his behavior towards me. But he knows himself if that behavior was appropriate for a god. There, here you are. The fool works. Now, put it on quickly because the battle is fast approaching and Ares, its god, just hates the dawdlers. Now, look, if you're worried it's heavy, then just let's just go there like that. And when we get there at the front line, you can rub yourself up in it. I'll carry it over there for you. Good idea. You carry the armor yourself, since you're already carrying it. Now, hand me that. That's it. And hold on to my left elbow and just guide my steps. Oh, the soldier needs a nurse. I just don't want my foot to slip. It's a bad omen if it does. <laughs> ah, if you only, if only your ability matched your enthusiasm. Well, come on then, hurry. I'd hate to miss the battle. It's not me who's slow, old man. It's you. You think you're going, but you're not moving. Don't you see how fast I'm moving my feet? <laughs> you think you're moving then, old man, but you're not. That's what I can see. You won't be talking like that when you see me there. Doing what? I wish you all the joy, joy when you get there. You'll see. I'll kill one of the enemy. Kill him by piercing this spear through his shield. That's if we ever get there. That's why I'm worried about you. Work with me, Arm. Work with me, damn you. Ugh. Work like you worked in the days of our youth when you and Heracles sacked Sparta. Oh, you and I could make Eurystheus himself run. Too coward a man to face a spear, that one. Ha. And then there is this wrong thinking going on about fortune, fortune and bravery. We think that just because a man is fortunate, he's capable of doing whatever he wants. Earth. Oh, moon of the full night. And you too, bright rays of the god who brings light to us mortals, deliver this message for us. Deliver it loudly through the heavens to the throne of Zeus and to the chambers of the grey-eyed Athena. We have taken suppliants into our land, the land of our ancestors, the land of our homes, and so we must cut through danger with our gleaming steel. It's a hard thing to bear that a fortunate city like Mycenae famous for its military, might hold such a deep anger for our land. But my dear city, it would be an evil deed if we were to hand over suppliant strangers obeying the commands of Argos. Zeus is with me. I'm not afraid. His love for me is justified. I will never hold men greater than gods. But it is you, Athena, that I call upon. To you, goddess, belongs the soil of this city. You, goddess, are this city's mother. You, goddess, are its mistress. You, goddess, are its protector. Send this man to some other land, goddess, this man who has marched his spear-loving army from Argos against us. Our virtue demands that we are not driven from our home. <coughs> we have always honoured you, dear goddess, with rich sacrifices, and we never forget the waning day of the month, nor the songs of our youth, nor the sounds of their dances, but up there, 
The wind-swept high hills echo with shouts of joy and with the beating of the feet of virgins as they dance the whole night long. So with that high moment of hope and excitement where we find a messenger who arrives to bring the news that the Argives have in fact been defeated with a miraculously rejuvenated Yelaus at the front of the battle. Not only did he make it to the battle after having some trouble in his start, um, but he also accomplished a great feat, not least of which is the capture of Eurystheus, who's then brought in chains before Alcmene. As the play reaches its conclusion, we turn to the punishment of uh, Eurystheus and a different theme in Greek culture. What happens to our defeated folks? And Alcmene only has one course of punishment in mind. No, <laughs> you cannot kill this man. But, but love protects him from being put to death. The city's leaders don't wish it. What? Don't they want to kill their enemies? Not those captured alive in battle. But did Hylas know this? Does he approve? Should Hylas disobey the laws of the city? Well then, this man ought not to live. He ought not to see the light of another day. That is his punishment not to die. But shouldn't he die now? There's no one who can kill him. I can. I am one who can kill him. If you do, you will receive much condemnation. I cannot deny it. I love this city. But this man here, this man has been delivered into my hands and there is no one who will take him away from me. Let them call me reckless or overly proud for a woman, but I will nevertheless accomplish this one deed. I shall kill him. Your anger towards this man, old woman, is mighty, but just, I, I understand that well. Woman, understand this well. I'll neither try and flatter you nor say any words about my life from which people will draw the conclusions that I am a coward. This hateful affair was not of my own making or will. I know well I'm your cousin and a relative of your son, Heracles. Hera sent me this illness and like it or not, I had to go through with it. This was a work of a goddess, and so I had taken up this battle, and from the moment I did, I began to contrive all sorts of terrible deeds against him. I stayed up nights thinking of ways of killing my enemies, of sending them off so that I would not have to spend the rest of my life pursued by fear. I knew well, woman, that your son was not merely a hollow name, but a true man. An enemy, yes, but, but a famous one, one with an honourable name, an, a noble man. And when he died, since his children had inherited his hatred towards me, what was I supposed to do? Sure, shall I not try my best? Shall I not leave no stone unturned to try and kill them or banish them so as to keep myself and my affairs safe from them? If you were in my place, if you had such a lion for an enemy, would you let its cubs run around free? No, you, would you not pursue them frantically till the end? Would you be wise letting them live in Argos? <laughs> No one would believe that. Well, now that they have not killed me back there on the battlefield where I was eager to die, the person who will kill me will be polluted. The city, being far wiser than you, has a greater regard for the God than it has for the hatred towards me, has let me live. There! You've spoken and you've heard my response. From now on, let them call me by two names. Let them say I am both an avenging spirit as well as a noble one. That's how it is with me now. I do not want to die, but I will not be moaned abandoning life. Alcmene, 
My advice to you is to do as the city decided. Let this man go. What if, however, I were to kill him and to obey the city's wishes at the same time? That would be ideal. But how could you achieve that? Simply by killing him and handing him his corpse over those to his family who want to come and claim it. Then, so far as his body is concerned, I will be doing as the city wishes and his death will satisfy my own need for justice. Do so, kill me. I'm not gonna beg you for my life. But since this city has refused to kill me, I will grant it this ancient oracle of Phoebus Apollo. It would benefit it more than it could ever imagine. When I die, you must bury me where my fate is declared in front of the shrine of the Virgin Goddess, Pallas Athena. Then I will be a friend and protector to both the city as well as to you, its citizens. I'll protect you from the hostile descendants of these children, the children of Heracles, who in the future will come here with a great army against you, traitors to the kindness you've shown them today. That's a sort of guests you're defending there. Knowing all this, then you may ask, how is it that I was not afraid of the God's word and have come here? The answer is that I thought that Hera was far greater than any oracle that she would not betray me. But don't let them pour any libations or blood or sacrifice victims onto my tomb and I shall give them a horrible journey back to their home. And that will benefit you doubly because with my death, I shall harm them and save you. Why wait, men? Hmm? You have heard what he said. Kill him! Kill him! It will save both my children as well as the city. He is showing us the safest course. He is our enemy now, and his death will be our gain. Go on, take him away. Kill him! Kill him, and then throw him to the ducks. And so you won't think that you will leave and cast us out of our land again. Yes. Yes, this seems to me to be a better way. Take him away, servants. And so far as our leaders are concerned, they remain free of pollution. So, Helena, as is often the case with Euripides, I just find myself in total operia at the end of this play. Um, I mean, we start out with sort of this, this high rhetorical ideal. We're going to save the suppliants. We're going to preserve their right. And then we end up with this sort of like, you know, agreement to ship Eurystheus off to a black site and have it murdered there so the blood's not on our hands. What what do we do with this? Well, I don't, I, I, I think you've asked a question that every critic <laughs> reads this play, asks themselves, why are, why are we ending up there where revenge has taken over and the chorus who is representing the Athenians are actually tolerating this for just a slight reason of advantage that they're going to get this hero cult, which is going to supposedly protect them against the Heraclidae, the future Spartans, um, as an advantage. And so that's, that's going to make them um, contradict what seems to have been a principle that they agreed to before, which is that you don't sacrifice prisoners who survived. Yeah. Um, and that was a principle that apparently a lot of people did respect, although I don't think it was one that everyone felt absolutely had to be shared, but I think it was a serious principle. And I, I think one of the, I mean, the fact that Alcmini is angry and vengeful after all of this, you can kind of understand the sort of accumulated rage, yeah. like what's happened to them. But the fact that we have the Athenians sitting there kind of going along with it is really what's kind of surprising at the end that for all those beautiful patriotic sentiments we heard about earlier in the play. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
Absolutely. I mean, I mean, the good half the play is spent emphasizing right, doing the right for the sake of that it's right. And then we end up with doing what is uh, advantageous, as you said. Um, so so to, to sort of disentangle this and maybe even make it a little more complicated, um, when Eurystheus is mentioning his cult site, right, um, is he a place in the Attic landscape? Well, he's pointing to a temple that actually exists. And if there were a cult there, we don't have any actual evidence that the cult was there. But if the cults were in that precinct, it still could be viewed as part of that sacred space. So, you know, people argue, have argued, does Euripides make up some of these cults mm. or not? But I think in this case, it would certainly be possible. And given that it's an Athenian cult, it seems likely that he probably didn't totally make it up. Mm. But in this action though, and this is something I didn't bring up at the beginning, I should have, it's taking place in the valley of, of the plain of Marathon, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, most Athenians would be familiar with this, right? It's a pretty powerful location. Um, and I'm thinking about, so the, the use of Eurystheus here at the end, um, and, and I can't think of another example where he is a full-fledged character um, from myth, because usually he's just sort of this like uh, pathetic tyrant king um, who, uh, you're, you know, Heracles has to um, serve because of, because of this problem. Right. Um, how do you see Euripides' use of Eurystheus here? Is it pathetic? Is it innovative? Is he drawing on traditions that we aren't as um, familiar? Uh, what's going on? Well, I, I think you're totally right about Eurystheus. Usually when he's represented in art, which is the main source we really have about him, you, what you see is that he's hiding in a huge bronze jar and Heracles is bringing yeah. back his various monsters from the labor and kind of amusingly threatening him and he's a total coward. I mean, that's really what we know about from but, him. What? And I think I think it really, it has a lot to do with, I think how important hero cult was to the Athenians. Um, appropriating enemies as people who are gonna be friends have a kind of special power because they were once enemies and they have that sort of authority. And then to convert them to somebody who's on your side um, in surprising ways. I mean, it's, it's especially for Euripides, there's so many of his plays that ends up with the establishment of these hero cults, whether it's for Athens or some other place. And people really worship these hero heroes and they really seem to believe that they were actually gonna offer some kind of protection. And I think what, what we tend to do as moderns um, is we make it too simplistic sort of heroes and villains. And the way I, so this makes me think of the story that Agamemnon tells in book 19 of the Iliad, um, when he compares himself to Eurystheus and Achilles to um, Heracles, right? And that, you know, they're both subject to divine forces that have put them in play, right? Um, and so I think, I think it's good, it's, a, it's great that you mentioned that the hero cults had real worship, right? And it didn't matter if you were, you know, the best hero, right? Or the more successful, you're a member of that generation. Even right? if you're the worst criminal like Oedipus and the Oedipus of Colonus, right? Who committed incest and killed his father, he can become a positive hero yeah. for you. In fact, it's precisely the dangerousness and the ambivalence of those heroes that gives them some kind of power. Right. Right, because they, they have, you know, control over that domain that you don't want to have a part of. Um, so one of the things about this play that, that I think you, you obliquely mentioned are the gender dynamics. And I find it, I find the contrast fascinating um, between the sort of uh, self-sacrifice of the, the uh, daughter of Heracles um, and then the sort of vengeful, almost fury-like character that Alcmena becomes at the end of the play. Um, so I know you've worked a lot on gender and tragedy. Um, how do you understand uh, this dynamic in the play and sort of the, the arc that it takes? Well, Alcmena, I think, is more of a surprise in some ways. Although, for example, if you read Euripides' Hecuba, you also see that Hecuba turns into from someone who is totally oppressed and has gone through everything during the fall of Troy and then finally in the end ends up in that play, also taking revenge on somebody who betrayed her um, and principles of hospitality. So 
On the other hand, there in the other um, Euripides Suppliant play, there's Aikra, the mother of Theseus, who turns out to be the absolutely patriotic spokesman um, as a mother figure. So women are very complicated in these plays. They can sort of step out of line in a positive way and be very, very authoritative and, and imitate male, male heroism in some ways. And in other ways, they can step out of their female roles and become like vengeful monsters. Yeah. And one of the things that, I mean, and we've talked about this in several of our episodes, is the depth of characterization that Euripides gives women in his plays, right? So they're not just, you know, villain or not, or, or virtuous sort of maiden. Right, and I think Macaria in the in the middle, she really she it, it, she's not too far off from other figures of self sacrifice in Euripides, right? Like Iphigenia um, or Menoikis um, in um, oh, which play is that? I the two women. Thank you. Right, mm -hmm. and so the, the arguments she make really remind me of Creon's son. Right, there's there's real echoing going on there. Um, so I want to start working some of the actors in to talk to them. Um, so Helena, you, you talked before about the only performance of this um, that, you, that you've seen, which is Peter Sellers' performance. Um, what, what were some of the things you saw in that play, in that performance, um, that you may have seen or not seen in the readings today? Well, what's, what was most striking about this performance is that Peter Sellers was really um, producing the play because he was incredibly concerned with the refugee problem worldwide, not just in the United States, because he performed it both in Europe and other places and in, in the United States. And you know, what 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 kind of attitude should we have towards refugees and should we accept people who have extremely good reasons for looking for refuge in this country? Mm -hmm. And this um, at the time he did the play it was a it was a very active issue and it's a very active issue right now. And so, I mean, obviously, if we weren't doing a reading, I think the presence of those, the physical presence of the suppliants would be very powerful for us because those children who would be very young, Makaria is obviously an, a woman who's, a young woman is ready to be married, but these boys are too, too young to fight. They're just little kids. And what was so powerful about Sellers production was the sense of that physical presence of those refugee children. And the refugee children, actually, there's a moment where, in the play where they, they actually shake hands with the chorus. And in his production, they actually came out and shook hands with the audience and thanked us Americans for accepting them as refugees. And so I think the sort of politics came out really, really strongly in this reading, but maybe not so much the sense of, you know, what it means, our attitudes towards refugees and their, their vulnerability, because we have the one young woman, you know, being totally heroic rather than pathetic. And it's really Iowa who's more the pathetic figure. But yeah. physically, when you see this, the play, I think it's more complicated. You have to really envision what it would be like if you guys were actually on the stage being able to do all this too. So, and so I think that's it's a great segue to talking to the actors um, because we get the, you know, the sight of you reading, but not the spectacle of the performance, right? And all those other things to create the emotional background. Um, so Tim and Evie, I'll, I'll start with, uh, with you today. Um, so uh, Tim, as, as Ilaus, um, you, you got sort of a, a, you know, a complicated old man, right? Um, who, who really had a clear sort of moral center and argument. Um, how did you read the character and sort of his arc through the play? Yeah, he, it, it was quite a, I, I, I found his kind of journey and arc and argument uh, to be quite straightforward and impassioned. And, and you know, he, he, he felt like he was unjustly treated and uh, that he would do whatever it took to save these these poor children, and so in in many ways it was kind of quite straightforward. I mean, I, I mean, I think <laughs> I think I probably hammed it up quite a lot, and <laughs> there's nothing like a a hood and a little bit of costume to to add character. I don't, yeah, and I sort of had a bit of a hunch, you know, playing playing old 
uh, like that is is quite fun. But um, well, and that's that's one of the challenge of the play, I think, Helena. When we were t- when you were writing about it earlier, the, about the comic features of that scene, right? Because it's really clear in the Greek, um, and then. You know how, how so when you were reading that did you see that it was funny did you uh... yeah i mean i think that scene when when he's being given all this heavy armor that he can't kind of even carry and then he's he's sort of talking to his arms and saying come on you can do it you can do it uh yeah i mean it's it's hilarious and i mean it's like it's slightly it's i thought it was slightly odd in some ways that such a such a kind of earnest and serious uh, narrative suddenly kind of went into this slightly farcical comic moment. I found that, I don't know whether jarring is the word, but slightly, slightly odd, uh, mm. but also maybe it was just what me. Yeah, and it, it felt like a fairly Euripidean thing. Uh, right. Lena, how, how do you understand that, that scene, that sort of movement? Well, obviously it's it's setting up, you know, a positive thing later where after Iolaus has emphasized that he, he he's the masculine defender of these children and he's so old that he can't be masculine anymore. And really, you know, Macaria has to sort of do that job for him. And I think you, you feel that he's partly inspired by her, that he has to kind of live up to, you know, what she's good for in relation to Heracles. And And it's funny that he's trying to do it but then you get the reward later on that actually he rejuvenated. Well, <laughs> Evie, um, after playing, you know, the depth and complexity of Medea, what was it like to turn to a character um, who was really sort of straightforward in comparison? I mean, it was a fascinating thing to have to to read, you know, them back to back. I feel like they couldn't have felt in many ways more different to just come forward and say precisely what it is that I think she's thinking. Um, I suppose though, both of them kind of carry the idea of legacy and what you're leaving behind, the control you have on the kind of world you leave behind and the lengths you have to go to perhaps as a woman, especially. Um, you know, it seems to to do that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, for me, when when I read that character, I I find her completely unbelievable, like, and not in a good way. I'm just like, oh, okay, I guess this is happening, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely does feel like, oh, that's con- that's convenient. That's yeah. very <laughs> right. Solve the problem like that. Yeah. Um, but the character, you know, in this play, that I find much more convincing as she's written. Maria is your Alcmina. Um, so I don't, I don't know. Maria, can you hear me? So, okay, sorry. I didn't give you much warning there. Um, yeah, so, I'm sorry. I'm having a little bit trouble with my internet. That's so it. that's, it just comes a little bit with a delay, but uh, I'm here. It's okay. I don't know if, if you've noticed, but occasionally I have children assaulting me. So I'm muting and not muting uh, <laughs> and unmuting um, uh, when it comes. So I think the Alcmina in this play is fascinating. She starts out as this, you know, maternal protectoress. And then at the end, like, she's fierce. She's a, she is a force. Um, how did you interpret her as a character? For me, for me, it, it is amazing to interpret a, a, a woman like this, especially thinking on, on the characters, uh, on the ancient characters of women that are always written in a uh, I don't know how to say it, like in an old-fashioned way where women are always like uh, submissive and always, and in this play, in the Greeks generally, but in this play in particular, she's like, I want revenge and I don't, I don't deny it. Mm. I, this is just what I want. I don't care about the law. Mm. I don't care about anything. I just want revenge. And, and what I love about that, uh, and uh, Helena, I'd love for your perspective on this, is that in my memory, most of the time, Alcmina is, you know, she's ingenuous. She's not even like a fully fleshed out character with agency, right? And maybe I'm thinking of her, her in Amphituo too much um, by, by Plautus. Um, but here, like, she's a, like a real person in a way she doesn't get uh, elsewhere. How, how do you read that sort of contrast? I think that the only thing we know about her is turning up in comedies in which she ends up sleeping with both her husband and Zeus in disguise as her husband one night and was very confused by the whole situation. 
Um, and then, or you see her, you know, shocked because the baby Heracles has just strangled a snake when he's eight months old or some, something like that. She doesn't really have a character otherwise. There's a way, and that's what I liked about it, about your, your portrayal, Maria, is she had confidence and certainty um, in a way that she, Alcmina doesn't elsewhere in the tradition where she's a dupe, right? Or really just, you know, the side character in everybody else's story. I know, but mostly women are always the side characters, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, I don't know, I, I was thinking, I don't know if you've ever read or if you know, um, this, um, this works from Marguerite Dursena. She's a French writer, uh, Marguerite Dursena. And she wrote um, many monologues of women. She was one of the first women accepted in the Sorbonne in France. And she wrote this, this um, book that I think in English is called, because in Spanish it's called Fuegos, don't in English must be called Fires. <laughs> and uh, she writes um, a portrayal of Clytemnestra where she stands before her judges and she justifies why she killed Agamemnon. Mm -hmm. And it's fantastic. And, and, and for me, Every, week, every Greek woman has this strength in, 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 her, in her. And, and we have always wanted to see them like either the, the, the stupid girls or the nobody cares about them girls or the really evil witches, right? Not like a normal person who has like good feelings and bad feelings. No, and, that, and I think that that's one thing, you know, I, I can cre increasingly impre appreciate about Euripides is the way he gives this fullness to, to his women. Um, so although this is your, your first week with us um, and you got, you got a challenging character because you got to be the bad guy at the beginning and then someone else later on, what was the experience like in preparing these, these, uh, these readings? Well, I think that, um, um, well, later on, I had the experience of watching the readings and see how uh, all the actors tried to make the, this, this fiction work. And even though we were, everybody was on different uh, computers and uh, I don't know, in different um, uh, time zones, but it, it happened in, 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 every, in every reading and in every virtual reading. So, uh, Somehow I tried to uh, put myself into that, um, into that world, into that dynamic uh, with all the actors, the actress. Uh, so my, my first intuition about this character was that it had to do, all, all his uh, motivations had to do with, with honor, with this type of patriotism that you have to defend uh, the, the national, um, I don't know how to say this, the national uh, honor somehow of, of, of protecting the land and not, uh, not be able to, to not, not, not let uh, slaves escape or somehow uh, tr uh, traitors. So somehow I, I tried to put my, all my objectives uh, into, into that line, into not letting uh, these these children escape, so uh, that's why uh, it, that's why I, I try to 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 put uh, our case in, in in that position because everything that he was doing was for the honor of not only for him for but for the, uh, his country. And I, I, week after week, I'm impressed by this emphasis from the actors that you have to take the character side of things, right? Because when I'm reading it, I'm, all, I'm always somewhere else. But, you know, these characters, they believe in what they're doing. And so, Reese, what I loved about your performance today is you had to be two very centered people, right? So you start out with a central character, that, you know, exuding nobility, Demophone, or Demophone. And then at the end, um, you're Eurystheus. Um, how did you go about differentiating between these two characters? Uh, between the, between uh, Copris and... I was for Reese. Sorry, Aldo. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. It's my fault. I, I made an awkward transition. Um, well, I think, uh, I think it was sort of easy in a way because 
Um, the first section <clears throat> is about protecting, well, what can be seen as, totally seen as innocent life, you know? So um, the prospect of innocence and what it can become, what it can mold into is sort of just, it's incalculable really. So I think like to defend something which hasn't had a chance to blossom yet is far outweighs anything else. So I found that there was, um, it was almost, I think, because I've got a child as well myself, it felt like there's no question, mm -hmm. you know, this is what needs to happen. And this is what always needs to happen. That's why I sort of when innocents die in war, it's always the, wor always the worst part of war. Um, but, um, and then, yeah, the transition to, to later on with um, uh, Restrius. Yeah, it was, um, to be honest with you, I wasn't quite sure. I know that he was, it was, um, it's like it was a complicated decision that he was making to sort of go kill me then and sort of maybe not wanting to die and ruling a kingdom. So I think the conflict, I just sort of used the conflict and sort of played that I didn't quite know what was going on and what decision was the right one or whatever. So they were quite, they were quite different. One was defending a very, very, in my opinion, noble cause. And the other one was sort of um, a relic or becoming fast becoming a relic, do you know what I mean? And I, I, I mean, you say you didn't fully understand it, but you were convincing for me because I found myself really sympathetic for Eurystheus at this point. Yeah, um, I, I think I think when I say that, I mean like I I wasn't focusing on a single intent necessarily. I think he as the character was it, at that point is just you know, he's just lost something which he didn't think he'd ever lose. Yeah. So he's sort of in trauma and trying to just do you know what I mean? So I think yeah. I just made that sort of indecision. And that sort of, again, it made it easier to sort of find a way through what the text was, really. And I think that the play itself makes space for that movement, because you go from the certainty and the high-mindedness at the beginning to the change at the end, and then Eurystheus is just there in his space. Mm, yeah, we're seeing that now, aren't we, across the world, you know, yeah. it's just, there's a normality and there's a sort of certainty, and then there's just a sort of tempestuousness. And, mm. How do you respond ever to that, you know? Uh, just by being in the present and trying to figure out a way through to the, to, to the next solid place where you can sit and be, you know? And we're, we're not finding those solid places very easily these days. No, no. <laughs> you find them at home. I think people are finding them at home yeah. in, their, in, their, in their own ways, but um, not sort of, as I said, the stage quite yet. Yeah. Um, now, is, is Emma on the call? I didn't see Emma here. I don't know if we want to talk about the scene selection. Um, so, so Paul, um, I, so you you delivered that line um, that would be ideal about sort of taking them out and murdering them in secret in such calm acquiescence um, that it kind of it was a gut punch for me. Um, did you know that that moment was sort of really critical at the end of the play? Yeah. I, I... It would, what really struck me throughout for the chorus, I think, was how often I kind of felt quite exposed. Um, that normally, you know, I'd be like, I'd be ideally sort of just turning around saying, I don't know, Demophon, what do you think? And I'll, I'll back you up. But actually, then in quite a few key moments, it's, oh, it's, it's, it's me. I'm sort of the representative here. So this is what, this is what I, I know you shouldn't do that, but actually I can really see why you might want to. And hey, let's, let's go with it. And, um, I, and particularly in that final scene, sort of the absence of anyone else from the city kind of really then put a spotlight, um, you know, sort of onto the chorus in terms of sort of saying, you know, shall we go with this or not? And that felt quite sort of surprising to me. Yeah, and there were, and there were a couple of moments, I think sort of, and in that final, the, the final words as well, so often it feels like the final words of the chorus um, are sort of, you, know, you could probably quite happily lose and not sort of lose an awful part of the play. Um, but actually it felt very important at the end to say this, okay, okay, then let's, this is our course of action. Let's go with it. Um, so it felt, yeah, those two moments in the final scene felt very key for, for the chorus. So before we close up shop for today, do you want to give us a playing Medea update? Um, yeah, I will do. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, your yeah, Playing Medea um, is uh, our competition that we've been running in the US. That's our close. We announced our winners from that competition um, 
last week and we will post those all online all the winners all the details about that um, as soon as possible the competition is still uh, running at the moment in the uk and in greece and um, all the details are on the out of chaos website and i think the uh, the link to that is below on this video um this is um, this is um our 35th episode of reading greek tragedy online on a wednesday um so well done if you've stuck with us all this time um we've got five more left um this year um and and one of the episodes that we have coming up is going to be dedicated to the odyssey um and that's going to be happening on the 9th of december and i just wanted to sort of flag up in advance of that that we are also um going to be reading the whole of the odyssey um in the hours leading up to that so um i think it's start we start at 4 p.m eastern on the 8th of december um and then we take a book per hour so that will then culminate at 3 p.m our usual time on wednesday the 9th of december and these readings will be coming from around the world so we're calling it odyssey around the world um and um lana and madeline and many others have put in a huge amount of work um to kind of bring this all together um and uh, yeah we've got um, people from um, every every continent except antarctica at the moment so if you know if anyone from antarctica is watching and would like to read then we'll find a spot if you know any penguins um <laughs> who would like to go then please um please put them in touch with us and um, but that's what we've got coming up for the remainder of the series um and next week though um before we get there on the 25th we're having a special episode on fragments of greek tragedy and we'll be convening again at 3 p.m. in the U.S., 8 p.m. in the U.K. So next week on the 25th, your um, special end of November meeting um, of the uh, of reading Greek tragedy online. This week, I don't want us to separate to part before I thank everybody who makes this possible. Um, our director, Paul Amani, associate director is not here this week, Liz Fisher, Amy, um, Emma, our dramaturg, Emma Joy Hill, our other dramaturg, uh, our producers, Lana, Keith, um, Ellen, Janet, Sarah, John Coley for his amazing designs, uh, Ali for turning them to posters, our special guest today, Helena Foley, it's a delight to meet you and have you here. Um, until next week, um, everybody stay safe and stay well um, and take care of yourselves. <laughs>